Okay, so today's panel, uh, we've got myself, Lee Price, as the chair, and um, I'm associated with uh, Rhodes University in South Africa. Uh, we've got uh, Radha D'Souza, who, uh, who teaches law at the University of Westminster. And we've got Tony Lawson, who is a British philosopher and um, an economist. He works at the Faculty of Economics at the University of Cambridge. And then we, the, we've got the three editors, Mikael van der Ingen, Steph Groman, and Lena Gunnarsson. Well, I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves and say a little bit about themselves. And each one of them, I'm going to ask them, you know, why did they get involved in this book? What was interest, why did, what first drew them to critical realism and these questions? So the first person I'm going to ask is Michael. Michael, could you tell us why did you get involved in, in editing and writing this book? Okay, um, so <clears throat> the original, the, the backstory, I suppose, of, of this volume is the special issue that uh, of, of the Journal of Critical Realism that myself, um, Lena and uh, uh, Angela Martinez D. Uh, put together a few years ago. Um, so the original idea behind that special issue was to generate more material for a book uh, such as this one, essentially. Um, but when the, the, the special issue itself had uh, had been finished and we put it all together, etc., I was the only one that had um, the time, really, uh, to push this onwards at the time. Uh, so I recruited Steph uh, and one uh, once uh, um, Lena had a bit more time she she essentially rejoined um, and we finished the project uh, uh, the three of us together um, so it's been a sort of long run engagement with this as an issue which for me is based in, in my PhD in which there was just a, a chapter on um, uh, the study of violent conflict and uh, uh, how to understand that, how, how to incorporate gender concerns um, into the study of that from a sort of critical realist-ish perspective, basically. Okay, well, well thank you, Miguel. Sounds like we have had a lot of, um, you've made quite a huge contribution to this book, so thank you. Um, okay, so I'm gonna now ask um, Steph, if you would like to tell us why you, involved in this project? Yes. Um, so first of all, I have to say a huge thank you really goes to Michiel here because he's done the bulk of the work. Um, so it, we, I want to honor that on this occasion. So as far as I'm concerned, how I, how I arrived at this book, like I've been involved with critical realism for uh, many years now. I'm an anthropologist actually. I work at Edinburgh at the moment. And anthropology is somewhat similar to uh, what we've been discussing here about uh, feminism and gender studies is a field that is very deeply split between one end of the discipline that orients itself towards hard science and, and biological scientific approaches and uh, the other end that is very strongly culturally oriented. And so my impression was always that critical realism is perhaps the one philosophy that can underfeed this discipline and bring mm. these two um, strands together without you know sacrificing one for the other and when we started talking about this book that was exactly the potential that i could see uh, also for for the field of feminism and gender studies and i think that the book does a really really good job uh, of that because it doesn't just take a single position. There is no such thing as the critical realist position on sex and gender, but it yeah. shows us quite a range of, of perspectives that have come together over the years. We also have a range of articles that were written quite a while ago to, uh, and, and some that were written specifically for this book uh, in, a, in a contemporary uh, time frame. And, and so on the one hand, we wanted to showcase what's possible with critical realism in this area, what has been possible and how this thinking has developed over the years. And we also wanted to show um, some of the practical things that we can then do with that. How can we really incorporate this into practical research designs? Because of course, critical realism has a tendency to be quite abstract and quite um, out there philosophically. 
And so uh, that's why I'm glad we also have some examples of studies that critical realist colleagues have done using this, this philosophy and, and using the tools of critical realism to do feminist research. Excellent. Thank you. That's um, exactly the reasons why I got involved as well. <laughs> I'm sure we'll be hearing <laughs> similar ones. Okay, so um, I'm actually going to come back to you all again with other questions, but I'm going to go on to my next person now. Um, Lena, what brought you to this project? Yeah, I mean, I, as perhaps you know from uh, two, of the, two of my contributions in the mm. book, I, I am, have been quite dedicated to trying to uh, bring critical realism into feminist theory and gender studies. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of quite deeply immersed in the field of gender studies and feminist theory. That's my home, that's my sort of discipline, my area of study. And I, for a long time, I've been a bit frustrated with the sort of post-structuralist hegemony uh, of this field. And like a, having a reader on a very practical level, that seemed such a neat thing to be able to, since uh, a lot of people don't even know about critical realism within gender studies and some other people know a bit and are interested in, in reading more and then you can just sort of direct people to this reader, mm. uh, which will be cheaper and more accessible <laughs> within 18 months, I can say, because then it will be become a paperback version. But Yes, so and then a bit more broadly speaking, I think it's timely to have this reader now because it's, uh, I feel among gender scholars, uh, critical realism is becoming more known, but it's still quite marginalized. But mm -hmm. there is some kind of longing for critical realism, or there is a, a, lot, of, a lot of dissatisfaction with, uh, radical social constructivist perspectives and discursivist kinds of approaches and uh, for many uh, like being introduced to critical realism constitutes some kind of oh wow this is what I really looked for yeah but not for everyone of course but I feel there is this kind of it really maps onto something that people a lot of people are longing for and then we have new materialism as some kind of other challenge to post-structuralist perspectives, but critical realism, of course, I think is more tenable and reasonable. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, Lena. That's great. I agree with you. It's um, so helpful for teachers, um, all of us actually, to be able to point people in the direction of a reader, uh, which will hopefully cover several different, well, it does cover many different aspects. Um, of these of the issues at hand a very good reason okay um who, who we need to talk to tony what's your reason don't forget to unmute yourself tony what's your reason to get involved in this book um i'm involved in the book because i found out their editors kindly included a chapter of mine in the book which is very kind of them um i haven't I must admit, had chance to read the book, so I cannot summarize the book, though I've read the introduction. Um, but I have breezed through it, and it does look like a, a very worthy contribution. The, the editors set it up, suggesting, as um, I think Lee, you've already said, um, they perceive the discipline of gender studies, feminist theory has been in disarray, or at least state of flux. They think that their philosophy of science is a, a way to go to resolve this, and obviously critical realism is the position within it that's um, emphasized. And the chapters are divided up into ontology, intersectionality, and methodology. My paper is in the first section on ontology, and of, of course ontology runs through the whole book, but that is where I, I guess I, I belong anyway, that's where I'm put. And perhaps if I could say something about that paper, because I have at least read my paper, if um, not for a long time. That paper mm. uh, really is orientated to arguing the case for um, 
in, maintaining realism, ontology, and a certain form of essentialism in the face of uh, feminist critiques of the time. Yes. My argument was I accepted most of the feminist critiques, but I didn't think that ne necessitated abandoning realism, ontology, and essentialism. So I, I made the case for um, keeping with the three or that sort of orientation. Yeah. People who know the article may have noticed that it um, it provoked quite a reaction. Yes, it did, uh, I remember. <laughs> four, four papers were published in due course. Yes. Um, uh, engaging with the paper, I re replied to the four papers and um, one of those respondents, Sandra Harding, replied again and I replied to her. What people probably don't know is that before the paper was published, it was about three or four years in process, in which time I received about six or seven referees reports. And the point I want to make is almost all the reports I got um, necessitated me not engaging with them and arguing with them, but pointing out that I didn't say what I was supposed to have said. Hmm. It seemed to be very difficult in those days to, um, to get across the idea that by defending realism, I didn't mean naive view that I, we could see the world, that our claims about the world are, are automatically true, or we even know what truth is. Or by essentialism, I didn't mean a particular theory of how men and women are, and which uh, men oppress or superior to women and so on. Just getting across that realism could be a subtle position and ontology was an important, you couldn't get rid of ontology anyway, seemed to be a difficult task. So that's what that paper really is all about, just making that case. Mm. I guess the question I'd be interested to raise for the round table, for the discussion later from my uh, co-panelists, uh, I wish I could look into your eyes as I Yes, see how... I can't see you, so I, I could just look you. at your screen. Yeah. Um, is, have we moved on or is it still the case we still have to make the case for realism per se, ontology per se, a form of essentialism per se? I teach a, a gender studies course, ontology for the Center of Gender Studies every year and I must say because it's to our lectures, I have time to interact with the students, but I do even there notice at the beginning a kind of surprise that anyone would come along and try and defend ontology and realism and, and so on, even, even today. So yes. anyway, that's the background of the paper. The one bit that was removed because um, people, the editors weren't so interested, was developing the ontology that I was interested in. And in particular, my own special focus, one I've worked on for the last 200 years, it seems, is positioning theory. And there was much more on social positioning in that original paper. Okay. And um, it is an issue that it does run through all the, the, the chapters of the book, from what I've seen at a glance. And I would, as a, a parting thought, I'll put in a plea, it seems to me a very important issue mm. is to clarify what we mean by positioning and categorization. Yes. Uh, personally, important. I think they're different processes. Mm. Uh, positioning, I believe, is ontological. Categorization is uh, analytical. For example, um, we might divide up the non-social realm into categories for us. Uh, we might distinguish water from copper according to atomic structure. And when it comes to jade, we put lots of different things, different atomic structures in the categories because it's useful to us. When it comes to carbon, we divide up carbon into diamonds and charcoal and so on. It's useful for us to do so. But we categorize the world as we find it. With positioning, we create the world. It's, constitu it's constitutive. And um, by positioning, I think of creating components of totalities. We're forming totalities and we bring people and things in as components. So for example, if we're creating a university amongst the components, our students, business of students, teachers, librarians, and so on, we position people, we put people into the positions and they're related to each other by rights and obligations attached to the positions. The rights of students to attend lectures and match the obligations of lecturers who give them. My right as a lecturer to get a library book 
may be matched to an obligation of the librarian to go fetch it. These match rights obligation pairs are social relations, the power over relations, and the social relations that are constitutive of the social realm. I think it's quite different to categorization. And I think this distinction matters a lot when we come to talk about what is gender and how do we allocate different people to different genders or different races, which I believe are also positions. So I see genders, positions, um, sorry, gender, race, class, etc., as positions, and people are allocated en masse by categorizing them according to markers like skin color or signs of reproductive uh, capacity and so on. And there's a lot of debate about how we divide up, how, how best to divide up, say, bi biological features and so on. And a lot of it figures in the book, and I think it's probably very good. But in a sense, if we see categorization as the process that's involved, it doesn't matter if categorization gets right or wrong. It's just a way of allocating en masse to gender positions. And once in gender positions, people are discriminated against or uh, or not, depending on what sort of positions you're in. Okay, I raise those as, as issues. My, it's a plea really for, um, not necessarily for anyone to accept my own view of what positions and categorize, categories are, or categorizations, the processes are, but we people at least say what they mean when they use the terms. And I think it figures both in the sex gender debates and in the intersectionality debates, and obviously it figures in the methodological debates. Yes. I'll stop there. Well, thank you, Tony. That was really interesting. I'm glad you brought up some of those issues. I'm sure we'll be discussing them in a lot more detail. Okay, the next one, I think this is the final person to talk to and get them to tell us about why they got involved in this book is Rada. Rada, can you unmute yourself? Oh, thank you, Lee. Um, first, I'm not involved in the book. Okay. Uh, I don't have a contribution yes, in the book. Yes. Yeah. And... Uh, well, can I rephrase the question for you then? Mm -hmm. The question for you is, why, you, why? what brought you to critical realism? Oh, that's a completely different uh, question. Mm -hmm. I think, well... I started with Marxism. Right. Yeah. Great. I mean, yeah. like, like many Absolutely. young activists, social justice, all of those like Roy things. Roy Baskar himself. That's right. Yes. Mm. And, uh, and like Roy, development, poverty, because I'm from India, and, and that was that's the main, uh, those questions. But I think there was a lot of unanswered questions for me. Yes. In particular, questions about nature, ah. questions about social conflicts, hmm. and questions about who we are, because as racialized people, we are, there is always a personal discomfort, even though we may speak English very well, we may, you know, read all the texts that you read or anybody else reads, but there's always the sense that somehow there is another world of meaning which is different. So I think it was those kind of questions that brought me to critical realism. And I remember when I, I'm a latecomer to the academia, by the way. And I remember, you know, when I was writing my thesis on water conflicts and uh, just by accident, so Roy Basker referred to in a footnote somewhere hmm. and then literally read him in two weeks. All, all the main texts. Wow. So that is how I came to critical realism. But having said that, I am really not sure, and this was my question to Michael as well, whether I'm the right person to comment on this book or on critical realism for, it, for that matter, because I, uh, I mean, you know, the things I say, kind of sound critical realist, but not critical realist, because other critical realists don't engage with it. Mm. Uh, I have rarely written anything without mentioning Bhaskar somewhere in brackets, but clearly the language and the discourse is very different from what I read by other critical realist scholar, which was 
And that is why I hesitated to say yes to this panel because I'm really not sure if I'm the right person. Uh, Ra Ra uh, hopefully, hopefully you'll forgive me for, you know, if I'm too incoherent because right. I have made a confession right at the outset. I think Radha is not a human being who follows critical realism on the planet who's looked like any other human being. I think that's the nature of critical realism. Everyone interprets it differently. And uh, if we were to limit ourselves to the panel to only people who spoke the party line of critical realism, we'd have nobody on it. So, um, yeah, it's really not a problem that you have your particular interpretation. But having said that, I assume you have had a look at the book. And uh, what can you give us your impressions? What did you think of it? Um, yeah, I did have a look at it. And, and the key word there is look. Yes, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's heavy reading, some of it. Yeah. Uh, um, partly also there were, I mean, time and, you know, all of the other things. But I think it is a very useful book at this juncture mm -hmm. the, in the present times because there is a lot of confusion and a lot of confusion caused by all the posted theories which sound, which have which is actually linguistic jugglery, if you like. Yeah. And it sounds very radical. It sounds great. And there are a lot of young academics, young activists who get, you know, taken in by the language and yeah. who really then are, are not able to go to that next level of understanding the real issues. Yeah. And, and this is particularly a problem for activists. And so I think it's a very timely intervention. Okay. I mean, you know, is woman a category? I mean, these are, these are very basic questions. But mm. also I think there are times when we do need to go back to basics. Mm. Because so much has, it's like spring cleaning, because so much has accumulated. We yes. need to do some spring cleaning to come mm. back to that. So I'm really, really pleased that you know, the contributors have brought the gender feminism questions back to basics. Yes, absolutely. And um, it's almost as if we need to undo some of the damage that postmodernism did and um, reseed contemporary discussions with what was good about feminist and gender studies in the past, which has kind of been lost. Um, I was reading um, an early uh, feminist. Um, Carol Christ and Judith Pascal, and they were talking about how they used to be able to speak in one voice. Now they've lost that and how they miss that. And um, somehow we need to, and that of course our, our power is, is caught up, not being able to speak with some kind of unity. So we really need to find some way of finding that universal that gives us our power as a community, as well as the incredible diversity. You know, we need to celebrate the diversity and have a unified, unified voice. And I think critical realism can offer that. So, yeah. Okay, well, and um, so Radha, have you got any, would you like to just tell us anything about your own writing uh, that you find, anything that you've particularly written that um, has used critical realism? Something that you found critical realism was very useful for in one of your published papers? Oh, I think most of my writings, as I said, it's there. It's a very light touch, Pascal. <laughs> Mostly, I mean, I don't, and most of my writings, you'll find that. So I don't want to, you know, just go into anything particular, but my book on water conflicts really had a lot of Pascal oh, wow. in it. Great. Um, my book on rights has a lot of Pascal, Pascal in it. My recent ones on Law and space has a lot of Bhaskar on it, in it. So yeah. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Well, I'm going to now move on to some more questions for the panelists. We'll come back to you a bit later, Radha. Um, I have a specific question for. I think I'm going to ask this question of um, Lena. Anyone who wants to answer it is welcome to from the panel. I have to find Lena somewhere. Hi, Lena. Are you there? Yes. So Lena, at some point you mentioned the new materialism. Yeah. I wonder if you could explain why you think critical realism has certain advantages over the new materialism. Mm. Uh, 
I mean, what, what new materialism, there's a lot of different kinds of new materialism, yeah. but what, what, what new materialism has in common with uh, critical realism is some sort of naturalism, I would say, or like a, a move away from the sort of tendency to reduce everything to discuss discourses, to mm. language, semiotics. Uh, so that's welcome, but I really see new materialism as being involved in this kind of flip, flipping movement. Uh, yeah. It sort of flips over to, it has the same sort of postmodernist kind of structure to it, the same kind of postmodernist atmosphere, but in a, a materialist vein. I mean, it's yeah. a focus on fluidity and uh, indeterminacy and uh, I mean it's very very it's some kind of inverted version of the discursivist postmodernism mm. and what critical realism has is um, the stratified and differentiated uh, ontology yeah. uh, which gives much more yeah, it's it's basically more reasonable than this very flat ontology that we find in new materialism, where the tendency is that there's not so much much structure to the world. Yes. And um, yeah, and for example, I wrote a piece specifically on new materialism and critical realism and, and Marxist understandings of nature, and for example. I think we need to talk about human nature, but I've never seen a new materialist talk about human nature. That's totally sort of at odds with uh, their whole the whole tendency. It's more like, yeah, it's still this kind of deconstructivist project, I would say. Yes. Uh, yes. So, and, and for example, what what I uh, emphasize is that. Uh, there, in new materialism, there is a lot of talk about nature as uh, just enabling, cons not not being the kind of conservative uh, thing that, for example, feminist theorists have. Feminist theorists have been wary talking about nature because it's associated with determinism and, and the conservative somehow, mm -hmm. the status quo. And in your materialism, they try to say, oh, nature is just, it's not conservative. It's moving, it's changing. This well, kind of thing. Yeah. But I, we also need to think about the constraining factors of nature. And especially yeah. in our time with uh, this climate change disaster, uh, I mean, we need to see there's, there's constraints that we need to accommodate to when we try to find ways forward as human beings and social beings yeah good well thank you anybody else like to comment on the from the panel on this question about the difference between critical realism and the new materialism michael i'm, I'm uh, yeah i'm unmuting myself yeah yeah no i i mean i i agree with what a lot of what um lena is saying i mean there are it seems as many new materialisms as there are new materialists basically and so it's, it's very hard to, to generalize um, but my impression is that it's that it inherits uh, a certain degree of uh, a cer a certain aspects um, from uh, post-structuralism post-modernism and it inverts others basically yes so See. instead of talking about uh, you know uh, language, discourse, semiotics, uh, whatever, um, we now flip back to, to uh, a particular understanding of, of material, materiality and materialism, um, which is rooted in this notion of, you know, uh, vibrant matter, living matter, um, uh, conscious matter, intelligent matter, these kinds of things. Right, all of it rooted in complexity sciences and you know new uh, systems theory and that kind of stuff. It's all very very fashionable and very very sexy, um, and it thoroughly thoroughly undialectical and um, in in many instances uh, 
quite explicitly anti-dialectical, and that is a major, major difference between Absolutely. what critical realists try to do for the most part um, and what uh, is coming out of uh, new materialisms, post-humanisms. Um, all of these things, again, are, you know, they're, they're quite diverse, but there is a certain degree of um, agreement, right, and there's a certain kind of um direction to it right and it's heading in a direction that in, to, to some extent is uh, compatible with critical realist uh, claims in the sense that it's trying to grapple with uh, anthropocentrism uh, anthroporealism all these different types of things that critical realism tries to deal with as well um and it's trying to get beyond postmodernism poststructuralism because it doesn't want to just talk about uh, discourse shaping matter or discourse being the only thing that is really there. Um, it's trying to get beyond that, but in a way that I don't think really works uh, personally myself. One of the reasons that we didn't really incorporate it into the book is, is because we're not really sure yet how long this is going to be around. Um, if, if this is, you know, something like intersectionality, which is now has been around for decades and you know been discussed and is the core to the feminist project now, or if this is a thing that is in ten years' time, right, we're not going to be talking about anymore. I think, so I think they're around for a bit. <laughs> New materialism. It, it's quite possible. I'm not I'm not su suggesting yeah. that, you know, they should go or anything like that. But that that's the reason we didn't incorporate it in the book, because at the moment it's kind of unclear what status that is going to be uh, yeah. in, you know. 10 years from now. Yes, I, I think what Roy, Roy Bascar said about it was that it's piecemeal. And um, if you could take, he was talking specifically about speculative realism and analytical realism. He said if you could take both of them together, you might have something closer to critical realism. But at the moment, these different materialisms and realisms sort of have parts of the story and they don't have the whole story. That's what I understood. So critical realism, I think, helps gives the whole story. Hopefully. Yeah. Um, okay, well, thank you. Because we don't have a lot of time, I'm not going to stay on each question for too long. So I've got a specific question for um, Steph now. Obviously, this is a question for everyone. So panelists will can answer the question in a bit as well. Um, Steph, I'd like to ask you, this is the big question, actually. <laughs> What, how do you think critical realism supports or underlabors for um, intersectionality? Um, that is indeed a big question. Um, and it's a question that I think in the book we've uh, dodged a little bit by focusing on one arm of the intersectional octopus at the expense of certain others. So um, it's good that you, that you ask about it. Um, in general terms, I think that critical realism is, is of course, a very, a very good basis for intersectional work because it can not only take all these different dimensions of oppression on board, so gender, but also race, sexuality, um, et cetera, et cetera, class, of course. Uh, but it can, also, uh, it can also combine them on, on, uh, on a shared basis, uh, a shared understanding. And I think what, what you were alluding to earlier, that critical realism, or was it Lena, the critical realism has this humanistic basis, mm -hmm. this, you know, whatever our difference is, there is something underlying that we won't like over determine, but there is something that we can retreat to. We're not lost in all these different categorizations or, and that I think is very, very valuable for this kind of work because what intersectionality is not meant to be is simply a list of different you know, categories that a person might fall into and, and might be oppressed by virtue of because yeah. just listing these things is not, is not helping. But what we need to understand is how do these things really interact? How does the experience of a woman of color, for example, differ from my experience as a white woman, uh, differ from the experience of a trans woman, et cetera, et cetera. Why are these experiences different? How are they different? And what do all these people still have in common? And that is, I think, one thing that that critical realism does very well, this, uh, this and also the other. Yes, that's very true. Next um, anyone else from the panel like to comment? Tony, are you sure? I can say something. <laughs> 
I, I think it's difficult to know what intersectionality is, or rather who speaks for intersectionality at present. I know that Kimberly Crenshaw, who introduced the term originally, uh, has disowned a lot of the current literature and oh. articles saying, you know, who, who is she anyway to tell us what we can and can't say. Uh, I think if critical realism can underlabor, to use your um, question, it is at the level of saying what are the questions and where is ontology in this? Um, I, I happened to look at the Wikipedia page for intersectionality recently and I noticed they have a picture on the right hand lamp at the top of it of balloons intersecting, I mean Venn diagrams in other words. And so the impression given that is intersectionality is an analytical device which Venn diagrams are. In the Crenshaw article, it's not, it's ontological. She has um, crossroads in the intersection with two cars going in opposite directions on each road that's crisscrossing. Mm. It's very much an ontological argument. And I think critical realism can contribute to the ontological basis of discrimination, whether discrimination is by group or lots of groups together. I think, um, in intersectionality, there's almost a, it's, it's almost like um, a rule that you can't add up the forms of discrimination. And I would say, well, it, it all depends. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. For example, if, if you're in a community where, um, let's say, women can't vote and black people aren't allowed to go in clubs, then for a black woman, that person can either vote or go to certain forms of clubs. You do sort of add up the constraints, but in other communities, people who are classified or grouped by skin color, by gender, by, by more or other sexual cate categories, by disabilities, whatever, are as a group assigned rights and obligations and the way they're positioned. So it just all depends. I think critical realism everywhere under labor is by just focusing on the ontology and elaborating and questioning it and um, taking it further. Hmm. I think, I, I mean, intersectionality, I don't want to say, I don't want um, it, to, it offers so many insights, but I think at the ontological level, it's especially it is currently confused. And back to the point I made earlier, so often when I read it, the word um, positioning and categorization to run together as though they mean the same thing when Sometimes they seem to, and sometimes they don't. Mm. Thanks, Tony. Lena, you specifically do talk about intersectionality in your paper in the book. Would you like to add to this discussion? Yes. I mean, I think uh, I, one reason that I was attracted to a critical realism in the first place, actually, was in, in feminist theory, gender theory generally, and in post-structural post-structuralist uh, theory generally, I saw a kind of tendency to, uh, to collapse distinctions. Right. Uh, I, I thought, you know, there was this uh, acknowledgement that which everything is relationally constituted. The human subject is relational uh, and also things are interwoven and interlinked. We, and uh, I was, fr and I mean, I agreed with with this relational view of things, but then I was sort of concerned that, but still, we can't just collapse everything into everything. So that was really a key, that's been a key thing for me with critical realism to be able to think uh, we can distinguish and differentiate things while at the same time see that they are uh, co-enfolded in one another, and in. On, in the field of intersectionality, that's also very, very valid because then we have this tendency that, oh, because uh, for a, a black woman, for example, you can't really distinguish her blackness from her gender and you can't sort of separate. This is a totality of things. So we can't distinguish anything from anything really. And then for me, that's been a key thing to to use critical realism for in these debates that i mean we still can separate gender from race and racism from capitalism and class uh, on a structural level 
relational level that we uh, level of mechanisms a deeper level of reality that create this concrete reality and we need to use abstraction to do that and yeah this is really my key thing here with intersectionality in relation to uh, critical realism and the reason we need to do this is other, otherwise we're not able to continue the work of second wave feminism to uh, theorize the the basic mechanisms of patriarchy Absolutely. Uh, and but also the basic mechanisms of racism mm -hmm. and racist discrimination and exploitation or the basic mechanisms of class relations because because it's moved up to this more concrete level where everything goes together and it's the level of subjectivity yes yeah mm. yes I, I think that's uh, that's exactly what i would agree with you know and for me it always comes down to again it's like you know, how are we going to be taken seriously as feminists how are we actually going to create a different world for women and men um if we can't actually come up with really strong theories you know if we can't make generalizations about structures and mechanisms of patriarchy um because these things are questions you know it's people are, we're constantly being told you can't make these generalizations because at the empirical level you don't get exactly played out in that way because you've got diversity at the empirical level doesn't mean that your structures and mechanisms aren't functioning at the, you know at the real level so um yeah so that's great very interesting any any last comments on intersectionality before i move to the next question i but i just thought i will i will come in a little bit on that i think um you know i confessed that when i turn turn westwards i tend to slide towards marxism yeah but I also tend, uh, when I turn eastwards, then I tend to slide towards Eastern philosophy. And right. that is why maybe, and, I, and I'm aware that that's very problematic for many critical realists, but maybe that is why I sit in the middle somewhere mm. and, and critical realism offers that space to be there. So I just, on that note, want to come back to this question of difference. Yes. The empirical world mm. is full of difference. Yes. Nothing is same. Nothing is same in that. No mm. two Tamil women are the same. Yeah, uh, and no two Tamil women teaching law in a London university are the same. So that's that's the world of difference, and the world of difference always creates contradictions, conflicts, tensions, you know, problems. And that may not necessarily be a bad thing because it helps us to push ahead. It helps us to uncover new realities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I guess what we need, perhaps, to think about is, you know, what is it that keeps the unity of the world? And I think, for example, Sufi philosophy goes furthest in this because Sufi philosophy starts with this question: when there is so much diversity in the world, then what is it that keeps the world going? as a mm. unified whole, as we experience it. Mm. I mean, I know that there is a difference between white women and me, but we still have a conversation. Absolutely. Which, which would not be possible if there was something that is bringing us together. Yeah. So I think, but there are methodological moves because that, that, that perhaps we need to focus on because in the world of difference, there is always, you know, it's a dualist world. There is binaries, there are differences. But mm -hmm. transcending that and going to that higher level requires a non-dualist approach. Yeah. Because without going into that non-dualism, philosophically and methodologically, we can keep talking about you know, how this is superior, how we need to get back, but it level, remains at the level of abstraction. Yes. And I, that, that can get frustrating. And that is why I think one of the things that for me i mean if we were to go back to very basic things about critical realism there are levels of reality there is the empirical world there's the actual world there's a real world and there is a material world and each one of these worlds going from one level to the next requires methodological moves that will help us to carry us over to that next level yes 
if there, those moves are not made, then we risk becoming very abstract. So the empirical engagement is very good, but we don't really get to that next level of reality. I don't know if that makes sense, but I just thought- Yes, so it absolutely makes sense. Thank you. And I, I agree with you. That's exactly the contribution critical realism makes, really. That's its big contribution. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Rada. I'm glad you brought that up. Whilst I have you, I actually had a question specifically for you because you're very obviously very involved in research, uh, on the ground research. You've talked about water and doing things. Um, could you just say a few words to imagining that lots of the um, attendees at this webinar are probably young researchers. Can you say how you found critical realism assisted you or has assisted you know, helped you with your methodology? Your research methodology? I think that again that brings us back to very basic critical realism here. Mm. I mean, it's really going back to basics here mm. because one of the most attractive things or helpful things I would say not attractive but helps to resolve problems because that's why we need philosophy tools mm. that will help us to resolve yeah. problems at everyday life and the one of the things that criti critical realism does is brings puts ontology right into the center of everything. Right. Yeah. But not just that, there's a nuanced ontology. Mm. So the distinction between nature and society and people, as in, you know, call it ethics, aesthetics, uh, you know, inner life, for want of a better word, whatever that may be. And that these three have their own properties. They are distinct in their own right. And, yes. But they are always related. Yes. They are always related. There is no, I mean, nature perhaps, you know, does not need us, but we cannot, there is no social life without nature. And there is no social life without the inner life yes. that drives us to, to everything. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's why we get wound up about oppression of women or race or whatever it is. So I think it is making those distinctions then brings the attention to relations. Yes. To the, and and that, is, that is what becomes the focus then. And mm -hmm. so for me, critical realism has been helpful in thinking through whatever the problem, whether I'm writing about water, whether I'm writing about liberal rights, and constitutionalism, how, whatever the social problem, it has two flanks. Mm. I mean, one mm. flank is the nature flank, because if we are all dependent on nature, there is always nature in anything, any social problem that you might want to address. And mm. then on the other flank is my own, uh, is our inner life. You know, yes. the things that motivate us to research. Why are we, talking about women because women suffer and therefore you know that is what motivates us to research about women why are women suffering why are people of race suffering mm. so that becomes the inner motivation to then even examine some of these questions and I think for me the, the challenge has always been to keep the three interlocked and I think very often the risk is that you leave one flank out and the social theory becomes distorted Right. You leave nature out. I mean, you talk about gender, you don't talk about biology, you know, yeah. and then at a time when you have these huge scientific industrial complexes colonizing women's bodies, doing, you know, all kinds of technologies, which in my part of the world is disastrous. I mean, if you look at aminosynthesis or surrogacy, the social problem that it causes. And aminosynthesis has completely destroyed the gender ratio in my country, yes. yeah, the sex ratio, and has led to excessive violence against women at a level we have never seen. Yeah. So I can't make sense of violence against women in India if I don't take into account the biological side, which yeah. goes in the name of scientific discourse, and yeah. the social side, and the emotional side, the trauma of so many women being burnt alive, raped, you know, all kinds of things. So, so I think this helps you to bring those things together. So another way of saying that is that critical realism gives us a basis for interdisciplinarity and uh, studying things from multiple disciplinary perspectives, which is hugely useful. 
Yeah, so thanks, Rada. Anyone else want to comment on the advantages of a critical realist methodology to research in general from the, from the panel? Oh, Michael, carry on. Please un unmute yourself, Michael. Yeah, I've done, I've done that. Um, yeah, no, just to, 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 to jump on exactly that, um, because that's what my, the, the, the chapter in the book yes, and uh, I was, uh, and is, is about. Uh, it's about Please Sorry. speak to your chapter. Sorry. Please speak to your chapter. It's on, um, what's it? It's on uh, feminist security studies, um, yes. which is a, a, a sort of a sub-discipline of international relations, mm -hmm. um, which is attempted uh, which, and to some extent quite successfully to, to broach certain topics uh, to, to, to talk about um, uh, sex and gender based violence uh, during wartime, uh, you know, mass rape, uh, these kinds of phenomena, um, which were not really talked about as part of international relations up until, you know, a few, a few decades ago and really up until the last decade. Um, but has done that on the basis of what is essentially a sort of cultural turn insurgency um, and, and has achieved quite a lot, right? But, um, um, but can't do exactly what Rada is, is, is talking about. That is yeah. to integrate the different levels of reality that the critical realism has to talk about. Uh, so very crudely put, right? In terms of critical realist ontology, it's multidimensional or multi-level um, and it very crudely put is sort of biopsychosocial, roughly speaking. Um, and what I argue in the chapter is that you can't make sense of any of those phenomena like say, you know, uh, uh, wartime rape um, without looking at, you know, three different levels of reality and abstraction. You can't make sense of it. Um, yeah. If you just talk about discourse, it's impossible. Yeah. Um, so that is roughly what that chapter is about and it's exactly doing um making the argument that Rado just made you have to do the nature side and you have to do the psychology side and you have to yeah. do the, the sociology or social science side as well yeah. I, I, I think uh, Roy Bascar said something like if um you can actually interchange social science with interdisciplinarity you, you can't do social science without this interdisciplinary perspective. Um, good. Okay, well, we've, I think we've come up to about the hour. We're, we're, we're touching on the end of the hour. I think um, I've been told that the next half an hour, we get to discuss, um, uh, ask questions from the attendees. Um, the first question that I would like to ask, and anyone from the panel can answer it. And in fact, we should have probably answered this question earlier. Could anyone give just a very short definition or description of critical realism? Maybe, or maybe even you, Michael, since you're here. <laughs> sure, I'm unmuting myself again. Um, I, it's not—it's not easy to provide a, a very short definition of what critical realism is, is about, but. Um, it's it's because it's an intervention in pre-existing debates. So if you you need to know a little bit about the pre-existing debates before you can talk about uh, what critical realism is trying to to achieve there. Um, but in 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 essence, the sort of nuts and bolts of it is that it's trying to shift um, attention away from how do we know things uh, that is epistemology to what is the nature of, of being essentially. Um, so what is reality? Uh, how does it work? Uh, that is ontology. Um, and it has a, a number of, of specific answers to you know, those kinds of questions that are supposed to, and I think to, you know, to quite a large degree successfully, um, move us past uh, certain divides uh, in philosophy, but also in, uh, you know, science and uh, social science, psychology, whatever, all of those. Uh, so there are traditional divides between naturalist and anti-naturalist. There are traditional divides between um, explaining and understanding, um, between reasons and causes. Um, these are, pre these are the, the pre-existing divides that, that I mentioned at the start. And this is where critical realism basically, by paying attention to 
um, um, and trying to theorize uh, the nature of reality um, tries to provide an alternative, essentially, a way out of the impasse that is provided by these splits between one or the other, one or the other, one or the other. If we're supposed to choose, right, and pick a side, uh, and what critical realism tries to do is to say, well, actually, we can do both uh, for reasons A, B, and C. A very specific way, yeah. Thanks, Michael. Um, I think that pretty much covers it. I'd like to go to the next question, which is now specifically for Steph. So if you could unmute yourself, Steph. Mm -hmm. And the question is, um, could we ask Steph how she thinks critical realism is superior to post-structural feminisms from an epistemological perspective? Shall I read that again? Well, uh, how is critical realism better than post-structuralism? Well, <laughs> in a lot of ways. I mean, critical realism, as uh, Mikhail has, has just uh, explained a little bit, is meant actually to uh, so sort of bridge the rift between uh, post-structuralism or uh, and the and the philosophies of science that post-structuralism originally was meant as an intervention against. So we have uh, let's call it positivism. We have the old uh, positivist model of science. We're just going to do our experiments and they're going to tell us what the world is about. And then post-structuralism said well, this can hardly be everything because, you know, things like discourse, things like culture, things like language shape our experience of the world in many, many ways. And we just do not have this immediate access to reality that uh, positivism has promised us. And that has then led us, I believe, a, a little too far in the opposite direction, where we're now in a situation where we frame absolutely everything and anything in terms of discourse and in terms of language. And Mikhail has just given us uh, the example of, of wartime rape, which is just one of the phenomena that you just cannot properly explain with a model like that, because there are material biological things going on there to do with people having certain kinds of bodies that no discourse in the world can explain. And that is what critical realism does. It doesn't say, post-structuralism is wrong, uh, we should go back to the old positivism, but it says we should now take one step further and, uh, and adopt a position that can incorporate both these old positions and mediate between them. So we can get pretty much the best of both. We can get what both of them do for our research, but we can also get a synthesis of them that can do more than each of them can do on their own. Hey, thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Steph. Anyone else want to add to that question from the panel? The advantages of critical realism over post-structuralism, feminism. Okay. Thanks, Steph. I think you covered all the important points. Okay. Our next question comes from Ian Verstigen. It's to all the panelists. And he says, can panelists say more about what Tony hinted at? positioning of critical realism discourse on race and gender in the academy. They, forms of irreducible identity and constructivism exist in a peculiar form that does not encourage a naturalistic or analytic form of address. So could you talk more about the positioning of critical realism discourse on race and gender in the academy? In other words, I think he's asking, how does it sit compared to other types of approaches. Anybody want to answer that question? Michael, look like you might be able to answer it. I'm not 100% sure I understand the question, so <laughs> uh, yeah. bear with me. But for, for, so um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, so, uh, and I may not be, so apologies if I'm answering uh, another question entirely. Um, but um, I think one of the things that is really, really important, um, not just about critical realism, but in general, is to take each problem uh, uh, on its own terms, basically. Um, there is a tendency to want to talk about uh, sex and gender as if it is a discussion about race or vice versa. Um, and I think that is problematic because there are huge differences between um, a phenomenon like race, which is essentially, you know, in the sort of 
pseudo-scientific version of, of racism, uh, a fairly modern in invention. Um, uh, we're talking a few centuries, which is, of course, you know, a long time, but not a very long time for you know, uh, human beings, mm -hmm. um, versus uh, patriarchy, which has been around uh, in lots of different forms for as long as basically, well, for, uh, for millennia at least. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so I think it's really, really important to be very specific about um, the, the differences between the phenomenon, their, their, their basis, um, whether biological or non-biological. Of course, we know that when it comes to race, that, that, you know, there are, there are um, biological differences between us, but they are you know, essentially skin deep. Um, none of them are, are morally uh, relevant. Um, the basis of sexism right is is quite different um not in the sense that you know women are to blame for their own oppression because they happen to be born this way or something along those lines but um we're talking about you know uh, something that is irreducible has a different kind of logic to it and has to be understood on its own terms each um and that is another something that sometimes gets lost in talk about intersectionality as if say you know patriarchy is the same as uh, racism you know, is the same as as capitalism and you know, class is the same as um, we can't talk about oppression in general terms we have to get to the specifics of it yeah okay well thanks anybody else want to add to that can i can i just add a bit of uh, to what what i just add to michael's uh, uh, comments there i think uh, I mean, the question is is real in the sense that you know there is the uh, irreducible identity and constructivism, etc. But I think one also needs to understand the politics of it when we talk about race in the academia today. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so there is all this talk about intersectionality. We are all you know, this can be this and that and that and, and, and all of that. But if you look at how it translates into institutional life, which is the social structure, university, yeah, then you get diversity trainers. So what do they do? They create tick boxes. We have interviewed five candidates, three of them are people of color, so, or four of them are women. So we have ticked the box but we have selected the one man or the one white man. So, you know, there is that whole exercise that happens, which continues to structure and perpetuate the same structures of power because we have reduced this whole problem to a linguistic one. Just add equality, diversity and inclusion and everything will go away. And this is what is happening in, in the institutions. The second point related to that is, you know, we the problem is not with the color of my skin or your skin for that matter that is not the problem you know because diversity means we come in all colors and all shapes too okay? <laughs> and and so that is not the problem the problem is the values we attach to those yes. uh, to color the values we attach to you know whatever color means you know so colored woman presumed incompetent now that's the value we attach to it. And very often we attach these values without even trying to understand whether colored women are really incompetent. Yes. Yeah, so, so because there may be many colored women who are competent or maybe it's just the way, what, what does competency mean? So, you know, and, and I'm giving this as an example because it's very common, there's a common assumption, colored women are incompetent. Yes. So, you know, so, so there is that as well. So to, disentangle that we need some philosophical guidance yes that right. the problem is not with our skins no. the problem is the values we attach to the color of the skin yeah. absolutely and of course critical realism is uniquely positioned i think to deal with the question of values um, and that is where the social issue, the social discourse and debate and deconstruction all that comes in but when we go to that extra length and then reduce it to something to do with the color of the skin, mm. 
then we are crossing a line between nature and society. That's interesting. Great, thank you. Thanks. Any, anyone else to add to that discussion? Okay, now the next question is more a statement, but it's, it's all panelists. So in fact, I'm going to ask the person who asked the question to ask it themselves so they can clarify the question because they vanished. Right. Um, so the question is, um, or it's stated, when we look eastward, I don't think dualism and non-dualism can be used in such abstract terms. They are established schools of thought that neither are neither relative nor fluid. I'm not quite sure what that question is about. Perhaps we could ask the question um, sort of how, how does critical realism deal with dualism and non-dualism? Anyone I want to ask the question, how does it deal with dualism and non-dualism? Well, can I, can I just, I oh, think uh, I, can, I can see Shruti's question and I can see where she's coming from on this. Oh, good. And indeed, dualism and non-dualism, I mean, this is, we are in a one hour webinar. Yes. And that is a big discussion. And I think one of the statements I remember Roy Basker makes is uh, you can go as far back as Plato and the dominant philosophical mode of thought in Western philosophy is dualist. Yes. In contrast, you can go as far back as Plato, if you like, or Buddha, and the dominant mode of thought in, the, in Eastern philosophy is non-dualist. Absolutely. So within that, of course, there are so many schools of thought as there are so many schools of dualism, you know, then you have, and then someone can say, oh, but there was Spinoza, you know, he was not really a dualist, so on and so forth. And those are philosophical arguments that have gone on for centuries and mm -hmm. will go on, hopefully, if we are serious about philosophy. Yeah. Likewise, in the Eastern tradition, there are many, many schools of thought. Yes. Yeah, Buddhism is not the same as Jainism. Jainism is not the same as, you know, uh, uh, various uh, uh, the Sankhya schools, yoga schools, or Confucianism. There are many, many, many things to that. And some of them may turn more dualist, some of them. So these are all discussions to be had. But I think the point is to recognize that to go from difference to solidarity, which is the destination we want to go to, it is necessary to transcend from dualism to non-dualism. And I think that recognition alone can take us to actually answering Shruti's question about, you know, uh, 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 whether dualism merges into non-dualism, whether, I mean, those are the methodological questions about, you know, going from one level to another. How do we make those moves? Yeah. So, yeah. Good. Thanks I think there's much. another question, but I'll just stop there. Good. I've just discovered that we've got questions on the question and answer section as well. So sorry about that. Um, I didn't know. But yeah, there's a question for you, Tony. Um, Tony, could you help um, an anonymous attendee work out the difference between a mechanism and, or mechanism and tendency? Tony, are you, have you got your... Um, I'm unmuted. Yes, unmuted yeah. If anyone can answer this, although it is a characteristic in my experience of critical realists, we don't always agree on everything. Um, a mechanism in critical realism is a way of acting of uh, things, entities in the world, whatever. They, they act, it's a process or a mechanism whereby once triggered, the entity brings something about. A tendency is a technical term in critical realism for a way of acting for something that carries on acting whatever the outcome. So for example, there's a gravitational tendency on the leaf. It acts on the leaf, not just when it falls to the ground, but when it flies over roof tops and chimneys. There's a tendency acting on it. It's a force, we call it a transfactual force. It's not just counterfactual. It's not just that it would operate if it dropped in a, a well-controlled experiment and experiment a vacuum. It operates all the time. And the force that operates all the time, referred to as a tendency. 
the broader process which gives rise to the tendency is a mechanism. The mechanisms are typically of things or structures or structured things. Okay. Thank you. Anybody want to add to that from the panel? Okay, good. Okay, I've got a question here about masculinities from Johannes. And uh, he doesn't mention anyone in particular, so anyone from the panel can answer. He says, hi there, I'm interested in researching masculinities, utilizing a critical realist framework, especially as Connell is often referring to a real ontological level, I see a possibility here. What is your take on the study of masculinities from a critical realist perspective? What extent do you think can Archer's internal conversation help bridge the gap between the practice of hegemonic masculinity and patriarchal gender relations? Thank you. Okay, anyone want to answer that question? Luna, you might have some insight to this question. Yeah, just, just I mean, what, what I... What I could answer is, I, I just want to highlight that, that I think I like Raven Connell's work a lot. And I think it's critical realist, basically. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how, to what extent she uses the term realism, or I don't think she refers to critical realism. I'm not sure, but I, I think uh, that's one example of quite a, an influential uh, author within the field, like sort of mm. respectable mm. <laughs> scholar within the field of gender studies that is not within this kind of post-structuralist uh, frame. And then of course, she's more related to re masculinity studies, but I, I yeah, I'm, I mean, I think masculinity studies that I see that as a, uh, subcategory of gender studies and I mean it depends on what you mean by masculinity studies because you know if you only think of masculinities as an identity or if you think about it as a position within gendered relations I mean that merges with like broader gender discussions so it really depends on that yeah okay Great. Well, thank you. Anybody else want to comment on you know, maybe critical realism and masculinity studies? Yeah, Mikhail? Yeah, just only just to, to highlight that, you know, questions of masculinities are, uh, are extremely relevant in discussions around feminist security studies, what my chapter is about, um, uh, insecurity studies more generally. And there's a very, very interesting discussion about um, the various definitions used, um, because there is a, there there has been in the past a tendency to generalize about um, femininities and masculinities and their relationship to war and violence, um, and part of the rise and rise of feminist security studies has been to reveal that there is no uh, one to one relationship between ah masculinity as some sort of transcendentally uh, aggressive force basically because most men um, uh, most of the fighting in wars is usually done by men but most of the men are not fighting and most of the men are hiding or trying to get away or resisting orders or whatever else it may be um, so one of the things that has come out of you know feminist security studies and the rise of it is our discussions around uh, masculinity and increasingly I think that is heading in the direction of a more differentiated understanding of what masculinity means and a more contextual analysis of how it functions in particular context, as opposed to saying this is the relationship um, between masculinity and war, say, uh, because and critical critical realism, I think, can contribute quite a lot to that discussion because its understanding of social science is inherently contextual, right, and it and it doesn't want to specify uh, a covering law between variable A, masculinity, and variable B, war, right? It investigates these things. Um, so I think in that sense, right, uh, it has a lot to contribute, but philosophy is still philosophy, uh, and social science is still social science. Um, the one can't do the job for the other, basically. Yeah, great, thanks. Thanks very much, Michael. There's another question for you whilst you're here. 
Oh, yeah. John Kitching. Oh. He says, can Michel elaborate on the dialectical aspects that critical realism treats better than new materialism? Um, okay, so that's, I mean, that's a huge question, and, and I, I'm not sure I can do it justice, but uh, I'll, I'll try. Um, the, the sort of tendency for new materialists, and it's hard to generalize about them, like I said, because there's a lot of diversity. Um, but there is a tendency, and it's, and it's not just their tendency, it's a tendency that's inherent to the academy, um, is to move from the one position to the other, right? From a reductionist um, materialist perspective to essentially right, an idealist perspective uh, or a quasi-idealist perspective. Um, and then back again, right? Going back to the, the hard materialism. Um, and the new materialism is a, is a, a kind of instantiation of, of that uh, in that it um, wants to talk about matter and vibrant matter and it wants to include everything in that category. Um, but it is largely unde undifferentiated and unstratified. It, it tends towards a flat monist ontology um, and I don't think we can account for things in that way. It goes back to what Rada was talking about before about having to talk about the different levels and how they interact as opposed to trying to subsume um, uh, everything in, in one level, right? Um, however vibrant that matter may be or however uh, alive your discourse may be or whatever it is, right? It's, it's going to result in all kinds of contradictions if you don't operate at, at numerous different levels at the same time. Um, so that for me is to say, right, we need matter and the material, but we need the ideational uh, and the, the, the cultural and discursive. And we need all of them at the same time uh, when it comes to lots and lots of different interesting phenomena um, to do with you know, feminism and gender studies. And I think that is what critical realism is, is trying to do and does re relatively successfully, um, make it possible to have that conversation and to have causal factors, uh, many of them interacting at the same time. Okay, thanks Michael, excellent answer. Um, another question from John Kitching. It says, following on from what Lena says, does this mean there is scope combining or merging critical realism and new materialist views on sex and gender. Um, if Lena, would you, would you like to take this one up? Yeah, uh, I could try to say something. I mean, uh, actually, I've never seen or heard about any new materialist view of sex and gender. And mm -hmm. I think this is, and maybe, I'm sure maybe there is, Mm. Uh, but this, I think, is in itself interesting. Uh, in my experience, new materialist interventions uh, operate on a very general level. General, it's very ontologically oriented, so that's what we have in common. Mm. Uh, but it's like very general ontological claims about the way the world uh, is constituted. Uh, so, so that's one interesting, ac actually one interesting observation about feminist theory generally is that gender is often not included in feminist discussions these days. Actually, I was, uh, so that in, uh, I mean, and that sounds very, very contradictory, but to an increasing extent, uh, feminist theory becomes associated with something else than studying the gendered features of reality. It's become sort of associated with certain kinds of approaches to knowledge, methodologies, or yeah, something or certain kind of ethical approach to the world. So that's in itself really interesting. And I think it has to do with the wariness you know, in my article, I, I try to defend the category of women. We can still speak about women. We can still speak about gender without, you know, including everything else at the same time. 
and this these tendencies that I'm discussing have actually led to a sort of marginalization of gender in gender studies so and when feminist theorists talk about uh, like how this new materialist approach for example they don't talk about gender or sex uh, that, as far as i know so in that sense it's difficult to to combine or merge critical realist and new materialist views on sex and gender and in gen so i, I think there's actually really decisive differences between the critical realist and most of the new materialist approaches. Uh, although we need to say that in some um, uh, introductions to new materialism, critical realism is actually included as one sort of subcategory of the broader new materialist trend. So that's also interesting. So you can categorize it in very different ways. But I mean, yeah, I, I think there are very uh, decisive differences. So if you would merge new materialism and critical realism, one of them would have to compromise a lot somehow. Yes. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure there could be very interesting synergies, new perspectives by putting them into dialogue, of course. Yeah. That sounds, um, yeah, you know, there's always something you can, there's always some truth in, in most philosophies, isn't there, that you can build on or pick up on. And, um, okay, well, thank you very much. Excellent answer there um, from you, Lena. Um, we don't have very much time left, but uh, I'm going to ask the final question. This is from Dimitri and it goes to Tony. So, um, can we really draw a dis sharp distinction between social positioning and categorization? If we consider that positions also always always also depend in some form on norms and concepts, e.g., social roles depend on expectations, ascriptions, etc., which are conceptual conceptual in nature. Tony, is your are you unmuted? Um, thank you. Hmm. You're probably asking me to be more dialectical, and I'm happy to be that if you'd like to use the wrong moments in the process but i think there's a a distinction between taking a reality that's given at the time you come to it and categorizing it organizing it for us dividing it up into categories and ontological constitution which is what positioning involves now clearly you're right in positioning we involve concepts we involve categories we involve the whole lot but still there's a distinction and everything becomes connected. So I think there's, there's, I mean, you're right to say everything goes together, but there's still, I think, huge benefits for making the distinction in the way I have. Incidentally, you say, e.g. social roles. For me, social role is something else again. A role is something like um, a devil's advocate. Oh dear, I've lost the picture again. Devil's advocate, which, um, or a, a joker you like in a group, I hope you can hear me, which mm. doesn't come with rights yes, and obligations, can, can but it comes with expectations of, of, of how people are going to perform, behave. Yes. Um, but I should say, as I said earlier, amongst ourselves we disagree a lot, and on, the, on roles and positions, Maggie Archer and myself have lots of disagreements. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Tony. That's wonderful. I, I don't think we have any, any time left for any more questions. So I would just like to thank everyone who's um, been involved. Thank you to the amazing panelists who you've answered our questions brilliantly. And also thanks to the attendees, who most of whom have stayed the distance. And thank you for your really great questions. Um, I agree with Caroline Kuhn, who's just said that this has been brilliant. Thank you for this. And um, I would like to, so now, sadly, time for us to leave. But um, thanks also very much to the Centre for Critical Realism for organising this. And um, again, thanks to all the panellists. So um, if you'd like to just say goodbye, everyone, and um, we'll uh, hopefully have another webinar soon. Thank you so much. <laughs> thanks very much. Bye, thanks everyone. everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.